I'm excited about this for many different reasons, but one, you can't tell the story of our church without telling the story of missions. I, I never get over the impact that missions has had on my own life personally through this church. I have grown. My eyes have been open to the need all over the world. Um, some of my favorite stories that I loved here hearing my father-in-law talk about were stories about missions. In particular, when he became the pastor, our, our church was in a, a financial crunch when we bought this property. And uh, he tells stories about walking around the property at night, praying, begging God, asking him to do a miracle. And one of the things that the Lord led on his heart to do was to take on more missionaries for support. So he brought that before the church. And in the midst of a financial crisis, you want to talk about unreasonable faith he said, hey, I think what we need to do is we need to take on more missionaries. And you know what the church said? Let's do it. <laughs> and they did it. Because if you honor what God honors, God will bless. Well, you know what God honors? God honors missions. Missions is the very heartbeat of God. John 3, 16. You all know that verse? Probably the most famous verse in all of the world. Say the beginning part of it with me. Everybody out loud together. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son. God loved this world enough that he gave his son and his son Jesus willingly left heaven and came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. Our God's very heartbeat is missions. He loves people and he was willing to go to great lengths and extremes to see people saved. God honors missions. One of our big goals, I was thinking about that project, $70,000. Did you guys, all of that footage there was live. Like Micah took that the last time he was over there. So could you imagine like 10 to 15 people living inside of a dorm room like that? Was anybody complaining about their house and their living conditions this morning when you got up? <laughs> that ought to put things into perspective, right? And we're not talking about 100 years in the past. We're talking about that's, that's in India today. That's how people are living, and for $70,000, we can build an entire floor. I think about that in compared to what we can do here in America. Like One of our other big goals is to have an auditorium in the next three to five years. I can't even begin to wrap my mind around all the millions of dollars that that's going to cost in our current economy. And if you want to talk about a, a, a big goal, one that scares me a lot, it's, it's that, because I know the financial cost is huge. But here's where I'm going with all of this. If we honor what God honors, God will bless. All God expects us to do is our part. What's our part? To continue to be burdened about reaching this community, to continue to be burdened about reaching this world. How about we just continue to commit and sacrifice and surrender? And by the way, our sacrifice and surrender pales in comparison to like Ningwan's sacrifice and surrender. I mean, what are we talking about? Maybe giving up a, a meal out, a weekend getaway? I mean, we are blessed $70,000 is nothing. We can meet that need, $175,000 towards missions. We can do that if we will pray and ask God what our part is and do it. I believe we can meet that need, we can exceed that need, and we can continue to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what God's going to do? He's got more than enough resources to continue to provide for the needs that we have here as we continue to move forward for his honor and for his glory. So guess what we're going to do? We're never going to stop. We're going to continue to live with unreasonable faith. So be in prayer. Um, next week, we're going to take up a special offering. By the way, in your pews in front of you, in your chairs in front of you, you will see a faith promise commitment card. You can take that out. You can get that, take it home, pray over it, fill it out, bring that back next week if you're not already involved in that, and we will get started um, on this project. And that leads us to our final message in the book of Joshua we're in Joshua chapter 24, and the title of the message this morning is this, Choose Today. Choose Today. In this chapter, all of Israel is gathered together, and Joshua is giving his final farewell address. And guess what he's not doing? He's not crying. He's not weeping. He's not sad. It's not his final swan song. Oh, my goodness, I'm about to leave this world. I'm going to miss everybody so much. This man on his deathbed, is preaching. That's what he's doing right here. He is preaching, and he's doing it passionately, and he's forcing God's people to make a decision. And he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Not tomorrow, not someday in the future. <laughs> 
on his dying bed, his last breaths, choose you this day, choose today whom you're going to serve. And the same challenge rings loud and clear to every single one of us today. When it comes to serving and following God, we can't put it off to another day. We've got to choose today and every day to surrender and to faithfully follow Jesus. I only got two points today, but don't think it's going to be shorter than normal, okay? (laughs) Two points. Here's number one. If we're going to choose today, we've got to choose his story. Choose his story. Look at verses one and two of chapter 24. It says, and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, everybody read that next phrase out loud with me. Here we go. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Joshua begins his last address to the people, not by talking about himself, not by telling his story, but by telling God's story. And you know what the beauty of God's story is? Although Joshua never one time mentions himself by name in the history that he's about to unveil, guess who plays a starring role in God's story? Joshua does. I mean, for most of the history and the events that he's going to go over, Joshua is there front and center, a huge part of all of it. He never talks about it. And that's the beauty of God's story. When you choose his story, you know what he does? He takes you and your name and he writes you right into the middle of his story. And it's a story that you don't want to miss out on. You, it's one you want to be a part of. There's a couple of things you got to know about his story. Number one, his story is improbable. His story is improbable. It's a story that should have never happened. All right, I'm going to pick back up in verse 2 in the middle. It says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor. And what's it say next? And they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. What's it say at the beginning of verse 3? I took your father Abraham. You know the beauty of why this story happens and why this story takes place is because God chose Abraham. God seeks and saves those who are lost. Whether we pursue God or not does not change the fact that he is 100% in pursuit of us. I have no reason to believe that Abraham was not an idolater, that he didn't worship other gods just like his father did and just like his family did. But in spite of all of that, God reaches down from heaven. He chooses Abraham. Abraham puts his faith in him and chooses to follow him. And because of that, he was able to rise above his circumstances all because of God's amazing grace. Can I tell you this morning, If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have an improbable story. I was thinking about my testimony today. I got saved when I was eight years old. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pastor's home. All pastor's kids are supposed to be good and follow in their parents' footsteps, right? You all know pastor's kids got different, uh, sometimes different reputations than that. But thankfully, at eight years old, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And he changed my life. And I was thinking about that, though. If I just go back one generation before, if I go back to my mom and dad, you want to talk about how improbable it was that I should be able to grow up in a Christian home? My mom and dad were both raised in Roman Catholic homes. My dad especially was a devout Roman Catholic home. They were Irish Roman Catholics. Any of you know any Irish Roman Catholics? Everything you would think about an Irish Roman Catholic family, that was my dad's family. Successful, middle-class family, Catholic high school growing up. That's where my mom and him met. Well, it was back in the 60s. My uncle got involved in drugs and the hippie movement, got caught up in that. And then he was gloriously saved. And a group of, uh, of people that led him to the Lord were the Mennonites. So for three years, my uncle witnesses to my dad. My dad probably thought my uncle was going crazy. They were probably glad he was back on the right path again and headed in a good direction. But for three years, he would go to Bible studies and he would go back to his own Bible and he would try to find answers to prove that his way, the Roman Catholic way, was the right way and that the other way was wrong or whatever the case may be. And after three years, he finally saw the truth and he surrendered to Jesus and he put his faith and trust in him and my mom did as well. And their lives were gloriously changed. Now, you want to talk about an improbable story. I got it. They went from being everything you would think that Irish Roman Catholics would be 
to being Mennonites. There's pictures of my mom in a bonnet. There's a picture of me and Dave in black pants, white shirts, and suspenders singing to my grandparents the crayon box song, holding up crayon boxes. Like, that's what happened. Now, now, thankfully, my mom and dad, they figured all of that out. They got into a great church. They got very well grounded in the faith. And, uh, man, serving the Lord faithfully today, they were able to work through some of that. But my dad, okay, my, grand, my, my grandfather bought my dad a car. My dad took that car, and he spray-painted it black because they weren't supposed to have any colors like in the Mennonite faith. All I'm trying to say is this. When he got saved, his life changed. And it didn't matter. Whatever it cost, whatever it took, I'm following Jesus. I'm all in. He's changed my life. He died on the cross for my sins. There's no holding back. And that has continued all the way to this day. And that has had a profound impact on me. That's why I got saved as an eight-year-old. That's why I stand before you today. Because of God's amazing grace and because of the influences that he's put in my life. You have a story like that. It's improbable. It should have never happened. But that's what God's amazing grace is all about. Can I get an amen this morning? All right, so his story is improbable. Secondly, his story is perplexing. His story is perplexing. Have you ever just questioned God and his ways? Has anybody ever done that before? Come on, it's church. Don't lie this morning, okay? We've all been there, right? All right, so... As we go through this history, let's just dive into a couple of these things. Verse 3, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. Now, I am not much of a mathematician, okay? But I know enough to know that one times one is not multiplication, right? And if you know anything about the story of Abraham, you know that God made this incredible promise that he's going to multiply a great nation from him and Sarah, and then for 25 years, his wife was barren. How are you going to multiply my seed if you don't give me children? And finally, at 90 years old for Sarah and 100 years old for Abraham, the most improbable thing, perplexing thing happens. Sarah gets pregnant, and she has the promised seed, Isaac. All right, it goes on even further. Look at the next verse. And it says, and I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. So finally, we're down to his grandchildren. And finally, Abraham's seed doubles. Okay, Multiple, he's, I'm going to multiply. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Did you know that Isaac and Rebekah were barren for 20 years as well? 20 years after they got married, for 20 years, there's no children. How in the world are you going to make a great nation out of me if, if there's no grandkids that are coming? So if you do the math, it was 25 years after the promise before Isaac was born. Isaac was 40 when he got married. What's 40 plus 25? Everybody out loud together? 65. And then 20 more years of barrenness, 65 plus 20 equals 85 years after the promise that he's going to multiply the seed, you finally have a double. You go from one to two. His story's perplexing. You ever, any of you ever wonder about God and his timetable? It gets even better. <laughs> Look at the next verse. It says in verse four, uh, we're back here, and I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Now look what it says. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But... Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Okay, so a couple perplexing things. Esau was the oldest, but God chooses to, to step over him, and he chooses to make Jacob his promised seed just to prove over and over again that it's not the way that we think it should go humanly. God works in a different way. So he skips over Esau. He goes down to Jacob. He gives Esau his inheritance. Esau's living his best life. God's blessing him. His family's growing. But he sends Jacob and his family down into where? And what happens to them in Egypt? They become slaves. For 400 years, for 400 years, Jacob and his family live in Egypt, and they become slaves. Any of you just kind of wondering how this all works and how this all plays out? His story is perplexing. I'll just give you one more, and then we'll move on. And then in verse 5, it says, I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward, 
I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. So finally, after 400 years, he calls Moses and he calls Aaron and they go back to Pharaoh. And after 12 plagues, God finally releases the children of Israel from Egypt and from slavery and they're headed to the promised land. And Exodus chapter 14 describes how they're slipping out the back door of the wilderness and they're about to get out of the way. And then it says that God turns them. And God leads them right back into the middle of the wilderness. Pharaoh hears about this and he's like, they're confused. They've lost their minds. They're sitting ducks right out in the middle of the wilderness. And so guess what? He hardens his heart again. He rounds up his army. They go to get the children of Israel. They're going to bring them back into Egypt. The Red Sea is in front of the children of Israel. Pharaoh's army is behind the children of Israel. And they're questioning God saying, you let us out into the wilderness to destroy us. We were better off the way it was before. God's story is perplexing at times. Doesn't always make sense how it adds up, but here's the good news. His story is miraculous. What did he do to the Egyptians? Verse six tells us, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you came unto the sea and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, (laughs) he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. If you know the story, he drops a thick cloud so they can't see. He also breaks their chariot wheels so they get stuck. And then he parts the Red Sea and the children of Israel walk through on dry land. And then the Red Sea comes crashing back down and swallows up Pharaoh's army. And God does something miraculous. And you know what Joshua does? He goes on and he lists a whole bunch of miracles. He says, I'm not going to read all the verses, but he gave them. God gave you the Amorites in their land. He destroyed them from before you. He delivered them out of the hand of Balaam and the Moabites. And then he says, I gave you Jericho and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. He delivered all of them into their hands. And then look at verse 13. Everybody look at it. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor and cities which ye built not and ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not do you eat. He piles it all up. He tells this amazing, improbable, perplexing story. But how does it all end? It ends with God sustaining. It ends with God delivering. It ends with God being faithful to his promises. And it ends with his people living in a land in houses that they did not build and eating fruit from vineyards that they did not plant. And every single detail of every single thing that God had ever said absolutely came true in the most phenomenal ways because that is who our God is is. So here's the practical application. Never stop following. Never stop following. Choose today. Never stop following. No matter how perplexing life may be, choose today. Never stop following God. We got to embrace his timeline if that's going to happen. Go ahead and um, put that uh, little picture up on the screen. You see that right there? You want it when? Now, I found that little cartoon, and I think that really describes who we are as human beings very well, right? We are very demanding of our timetable. If things don't work out in our way, in our time, the way that we want them to, we start throwing little hissy fits. Now, I am not saying that God is in heaven laughing at us. That is not the point of that. The point of that is more to show us our, how unreasonable we can be in our demands of God. The point is not that God is in heaven looking down at us laughing. No, God is the furthest thing from that. God is loving. The Bible tells us that he understands our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He is patient with us. He is kind to us. But make no mistake about it. God works on a different timetable than you and I work. And he's faithful. And all our job is to do is to continually follow him every single day of our lives, even if we can't see what he's doing, even if we can't see how he's moving and how he's working. It does not change the fact that he is. He is moving. He is working. Our job isn't to worry about the results. Our job is just to be faithful and to follow no matter what, because he's faithful. So um, we got to embrace his timeline. You know what else we got to do? We got to embrace the hard with the good. Yeah, we like the good. And I've liked preaching through the book of Joshua because there is a lot of good that it's easy to preach. And God does want to bless. And that is true of every single Christian in here. Make no mistake about it. He even wants to take the bad and work it for good. God is a good God. And he wants to pour out his blessings on everybody here. But we got to embrace the hard with the good. 
Yesterday, I was taking Saban to um, a, a Bible study. He was doing some discipleship with Christian, who was here this summer, one of our summer interns. And I was asking him on the way there, I was like, so tell me what you learned this week. What was something you, you learned from the lesson? What are you guys going to be talking about today? And Saban drops this, this great line, and I said, man, I'm going to have to use that in the message tomorrow. So you can thank Saban for this right here. But one of the things that he learned was this. God's view of life is this. Life is a test. Life is a trust. And life is a temporary assignment. God's view of life is it's a test. It's a trust. And it's a temporary assignment. I cannot sit here today and tell you all the reasons why God allows his children to be barren. God allows his children to suffer. God allows affliction. Why God allows suffering in the wilderness or those wilderness periods in my life. I, I can't sit here and tell you all the reasons why that happens and takes place. But I know this, that my God is faithful. And I know that even in the testing and even in the trials and, and, and even in the temporary assignments that he sends our way, that he is faithful and he is good and he is right. And he's going to work it all out the way that he wants to. You know what I love about God? God doesn't try to to hide the hard stuff from us. In fact, he just brings it out every time. Like, if you're gonna follow me, well then you gotta die to yourself, take up your cross and follow me. I love the New Testament. He's drawing great crowds of people to himself. And instead of just saying, hey, if you just keep following me, man, the blessings are gonna come, he's gonna say, no, if you follow me, it's gonna be hard. You can't hack it, actually. So, and you know what? The crowds were bewildered. And many of them turned around. God doesn't try to hide the hard stuff from us. He is honest. He is trustworthy. In fact, he tells us to expect hard times. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. All of us in this world are going to experience suffering and affliction. And by the way, make no mistake about it. The lost world is suffering as well because we live in a sin-cursed world. So think it not strange. Embrace the hard with the good because we know how it all ends. Our God is a miraculous God and he's able to part the Red Sea and he's able to knock down the walls and he is moving and he is working and he is faithful whether we see it in our life or not. So never stop following. Never stop following. Secondly, not only do we need to choose his story, but we need to choose his service. I love the way this chapter ends, man. This is, I'm just gonna read a lot of verses to you, give you a couple applications, but man, the Bible speaks loud and clear for itself. Verse 14, everybody follow along as we go through these. So here Joshua is, he gets done telling the history. And now, I remember when I told you he was preaching? This man is preaching. Verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. You know, the first thing we learn about God's service is this. It is exclusive. Put away all other gods. Serve God and God alone. By the way, that goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Honor, the, I mean, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. All four of those have to do with the fact that God needs to be number one and that his service, he demands exclusivity. No other gods, nothing else. Him first above everything. Now look at verse 15. Look at the very first line. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Joshua knows his people. In spite of God's goodness, guess what's happening inside the land? Apathy is creeping in. Also, we, we, we saw a couple weeks ago, in spite of all of the ways that God blessed and in spite of all of the lessons that they had already learned about idolatry and some of the really hard lessons they learned about idolatry, there were still some people amongst the children of Israel that wanted to worship other gods, that wanted to be like the rest of this world. And you know what the reality is? I'm not naive enough to believe that there's not many people sitting here today that when you think about full surrender and you think about God's service being exclusive, that you're having a bit of a hard time with that. I'm not going to say that you go as far as you think it is evil to serve the Lord, but you definitely question it. And you're like, man, if I give my life to God, he's going to ask me for my money. He's going to ask me for my time. 
He's going to ask me to give my dreams and hand them over to him. And he's going to ask me to, to follow him. He might call me to be a missionary. He might call me to go to India or to Africa or wherever the case may be. I know those thoughts go in the back of your head because guess what? That's where I was. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pastor's home. But I struggled as a teenager surrendering to God because in for some reason, I, I, I sort of viewed God's plans as a threat to my plans. And for some reason, I thought that maybe I knew better than God knows. But I love what Joshua does in this passage. He makes it as plain and clear as you possibly can. Okay, fine. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, well, then choose you this day whom you will serve. And then he lays out the options. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood. By the way, how did that work out for Abraham and his family? Those gods, those idols, do you think they delivered? Do you think they were good to Abraham and his family? Or he gives them another option. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Oh yeah, remember the Amorites? The ones that are no longer in existence because the Lord delivered them into your hands? How did that God work out for them? How did those idols work out for them? And if you wanna bring it into modern day terminology, man, he is laying it out on the line. Who are you gonna serve? You gonna serve God who's miraculous and can do anything or what? You gonna serve money? Are you gonna serve comfort? Are you gonna serve fame? Are you gonna serve success? Are you going to serve the next high? Are you going to serve whatever it is that your heart desires? Are you going to serve yourself? You know what I believe the great American idol is? The greatest of all American idols? It is me. I stand before you today and I confess. I struggle with me every single day of my life. I, I, I hate the struggle that I have with me. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. I am selfish. And when it comes to laying my life on the line, and when God, when the rubber really meets the road, it's not easy. And I'm confronted with myself every single day of my life. But am I going to serve God or am I going to serve myself? Because I have to ask myself, how often, how often is serving me and following the things that I wanted to do? How good does that work out for me? You know, when I don't sleep good at night, it's because I'm selfish and I'm not trusting God. You know, when I'm frustrated and when things aren't going my way, it's because I'm selfish and things aren't working out the way that I think that they should. And you know what? You might be here today and maybe your life has been fine and you're just rocking along, going through life like my mom and dad were, but you're finding out that there's a better way. <laughs> hey, take that better way. Choose you this day whom you will serve because everybody is serving someone. Everybody is serving something. There's no other way around it. And it's either God who is blessing. It is either God who will sustain you in the hard times or it is yourself who will let you down every single time. Joshua has been down this road. He's seen it all. And he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The service is exclusive. The service is demanding. You think right now, man, this is time to close this service up and go into an invitation, right? That's what you would think. Joshua's not done. <laughs> Look at verses 16 through 18. He forces them into a decision. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight I love that next phrase, and preserved us, even in our sufferings and in our afflictions, he preserves us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelled in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, everybody out loud, together with conviction, for he is our God. Man, they made the right choice, right? Everything's going along grand. Look what Joshua says in verse 19. <laughs> and Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. Okay, so let me just put this in a modern way that we can understand it. He's preaching his message. He calls them, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. They stand up. They flood the altars, man. We're going to serve the Lord. He's our God. We get it. We see how great and wonderful and amazing he is. Here's our life. And he stops the invitation. 
And he looks at everybody on their knees, crying out to God. And he looks them in the face and says, you can't serve God. No, you don't get it. His service is demanding. If you forsake him and turn away from him, he'll drive you out of the land. He'll, he's a jealous God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. You don't understand the commitment that you're making. You can't just come down here and pray that prayer and say that with your words and then go outside those doors and go back to living the same way that you've been living all along. No, that's not how it works. He wants all of you. He doesn't want you just to want him. He doesn't want you just to want the idea of him. He wants your life. He wants your surrender. He wants your all. He wants you to choose this day, today, who am I going to serve? As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord comes back to them again that's where the rubber meets the road now thankfully again they choose the right thing if you look at verse 21 it says and the people said unto Joshua nay but we will serve the Lord and I tell you this morning you might be sitting here thinking wow that is harsh God's jealous He's not going to have it any other way. Can I, can I remind you that his timeline is not the same as our timeline? It took 85 years before he doubled Abraham's seed. And you can walk out of these doors today and you can go back to your same life and you can continue to try to walk the fence, serve two gods. You can be comfortable and apathetic. And you might not see the result of it today, but make no mistake about it. God is a jealous God. It will, payday will come someday. It's absolutely true. And the reason why God puts the line so clearly is because there is no middle way. Just look around you at this world that chases after every dream and every desire of their own heart and look where it gets them. Our world is broken. Our world is in desperate need of hope. Our world has suicide rates that are rocketing out of control. Our world's more addicted than ever before and struggles, struggles with those types of things. Our world is a mess because their God is never going to answer what they're looking for and what their heart is crying out for. And yes, our our God is exclusive and our God is demanding, but it's only because that is the way to blessing. That is the way to his goodness. And how could we ever walk away from such a good God, a miraculous God, a God who sustains, a God who provides, a God who blesses. Choose you today whom you will serve. As for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Never stop surrendering. It's our job. Never stop following. Never stop surrendering. It's a choice we have to make every day. Man, you can put yourself on the cross today, and guess what? Tomorrow it's going to wake up, and it's going to be right there to deal with again, and we've got to choose it every day. Never stop surrendering. Never stop choosing Jesus above everything else. The question I want to ask you in our church as we close this morning is, what can God do in us? What can God do through us if we're fully surrendered? If we choose today, I'm humbled by men like Ning Wong. I don't even know if I said his name right. I'm humbled by guys like that. He's in India, came to know Jesus as a savior. What I, what I love about this ministry is he's, not, he's got no outside help up to this point at all. He's just done it himself in his own country. You know, he just went to Bible college, found a way to pay for it, starts that work in his sister's house, uses whatever means, whatever scraps they can come up with, however God blesses, and they've been able to build that ministry. And here's what I love. As, as people follow God and pursue God, man, he can take our church on the other side of the world, and he can use us to meet an incredible need to just pour fuel on what he's doing. But I, I think of that man, and I think about the sacrifices he's made, and I think about those closed countries and those difficult-to-reach areas of this world. Just to put it in perspective, I wanted to take a mission trip over there. But then we started talking to Micah about the logistics. It takes two full days to travel. It is not some easy trip that's, I mean, it's hard to even get there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And Micah's going to go, and we probably will go with some people. If you're interested in that, let us know. But I'm telling you, it, it, it would just require sacrifice on our part just to even get there. And yet God's using him. What can God do through you if you fully surrender? Are you fully surrendered? Does he have your whole heart, your whole soul, 
all your affection. See, I was all, every fiber of our being. God, all I want to do is serve you. I just want to follow you. I just want you to have control. When we get to that point in our lives, that's where God can begin to work. What can God do through our church? If that's our heart and that's an attitude and that's the approach that we have. Oh, God wants to do great things. Make no mistake about it. God's power has not waned. The difficulties of this world are not too great. No, he is the same God. He has always been and he loves to do impossible things. All he's doing is waiting for his people to surrender.